I'm going to talk about synthetic personal genomes. And if you search for this on the, I think this is a new topic, because if you search on it at Google, you will not find uh, uh, synthetic personal genomes. And of course, I can only give you an a, a inkling of how we're uh, pursuing this uh, in the next few minutes. Um, so who in this room believes that they're not mutant in some way that's potentially medically significant? Uh, I will. Uh, admit that, that, that I am mutant for a bunch of things that aren't very good, and th these and other medical records of myself and a thousand, over a thousand other volunteers is now online as of a few days ago. Uh, mine's been on there for a while, but a thousand are on a few days ago at personalgenomes.org. And the important thing is here now, genomes are getting uh, inexpensive enough that we are now focusing on phenomes. Now, for those of you who have, may have seen these headlines, might think this is what I'm talking about, and therefore shouldn't listen to the rest of the talk because I failed in the last 36 years. But actually, this is referring to a, a very specialized part of genomics, which I don't practice, which has to do with common uh, variants. Um, and even so, uh, but I wanted to bring this out just in case, because it's a, a misconception that I'm going to talk about genomics I think that works. And uh, in a certain sense, that last slide uh, is, is we haven't done enough, and we will work harder. But uh, the Model T didn't, uh, didn't fly. It didn't even provide air conditioning or, uh, or seat belts or any of the power brakes. Uh, but it did drop the price uh, by a factor of 10. And the result was that 15 million of these cars were sold. Uh, Genomics doesn't solve all the global problems in the world, um, but we have dropped the price a millionfold, not tenfold, a millionfold in the last few years, and I'll document that in a, in a slide. So glass is not only half full, it's filling fast. And Juan Enriquez and, and David Agus were really great introductions for this talk. I'm going to talk about how we think green chemistry and personal genomes are coming together. So this year's U.S. Presidential Green Chemistry Award, uh, one of them at least, went to LS9, which is a company I started about five years ago, for their work in not just thinking about but actually producing large numbers, uh, uh, large amounts of chemicals like hydrocarbons and uh, uh, from biological processes in, in gut bacteria, E. coli. And other co companies uh, can, uh, can do make drugs and, uh, and vaccines and so forth. Now, those production systems, which gr will grow into the millions and billions of liters, uh, <clears throat> are impacted by viruses. So making chemicals, drugs, and vaccines uh, are subject to viruses. And some viruses, uh, whether they're it, are resistant to both drugs and vaccines. So this is a significant issue. So, and this leads us to this question of viruses. is just one of many things that leads us to why should we synthesize or change and make radically new genomes? Not copies of genomes, but radically new genomes. And I will argue that at least one of the first applications, just like the first applications of personal computers, uh, is a safety productivity win-win situation. Um, we can make these new amino acids that are, uh, that are up there for chemists in the group. Uh, we can isolate these genomes from the environment so they don't exchange material. And as an example of that, we can make strains that are resistant to all viruses by changing the genetic code genome-wide. And we've now done that for one of the 64 codons, the triplet codons common to all life. How does this apply to humans? Uh, I mean, that, could, that will apply to industrial microorganisms, agriculture, and maybe humans. We have a database called NH database uh, that has uh, almost 900 species in it. And you can plot the, the size of the organism versus their maximum lifetime. And you've seen pictures of this. Coincidentally, I didn't actually arrange for the pictures. Uh, but we're actually sequencing, we and others are sequencing some of these key genomes where they have lifespans of 405 years or 220 years and so forth. And you can see these are outliers on this plot. Uh, the clam, the, the naked mole rat, the capuchin monkey, uh, humans, and bowhead whales. <clears throat> and why is it that, that one person lives 
so much longer than another. That's personal genomics we'd like to get at. It'll take a while. Why can we even consider sequencing all these very large genomes and maybe even every human on the planet many times over? It's because uh, the technology has improved by factors of 1.5 per, per year for many decades. Then in 2005, it switched to factors of 10 per year. And so Juan's vision is, uh, is uh, getting a little bit closer because the, the, the rate of change is actually quite significant here. This, we need many other technologies as well, and I'll, I'm telling you about the synthetic ones. Now, all that wonderful technology is only as good as the shared ecosystems. We can have phones, personal computers, World Wide Web, and it's, but if you just have, if you're the only person in the world with a cell phone, it's not very useful. Uh, you have to share it with somebody. And it's ironic that the best encyclopedia in the world is one where everybody in the world can edit it. Think about that, how important that is, okay? So <clears throat> who do we want to uh, have access to personal genome research data? We could let whoever collects the data be the only ones in the world to have access to it, or their friends. <clears throat> or what about the scenario you have an outsider, maybe not an insider, not a professor or a, or a company uh, who collected the data, like this 26-year-old patent clerk uh, who was not a professor or insider in any stretch of the imagination, um, kind of a loser, really, uh, until 1905, where he published four papers, each of which was worthy of a Nobel Prize, and indeed, one of them did get him a Nobel Prize. And so are there people like that out in the world, maybe in, in developing nations that happen to have a $12 computer uh, that could make a big contribution if they have access to all the data, not just the little piece that trickles out? Uh, and so I'm passionate about the idea of having at least one source of data that is uh, really, truly open access. So how do we do that? Now these are some of my heroes, people that inspire me. They are not insiders, professors, and so forth. They are passionate because their family is affected, uh, you know, like Lorenzo Zoyle and Kay All there in the middle top was an undergraduate from MIT in my Harvard course, and she went off on her own in her apartment and studied her genome without company involved, any company read uh, tools, uh, kits, uh, and no university and no FDA, and, uh, and this is what's happening. Now you could, this is a frequently asked question, if health is mostly environmental, why do we need genetics? And the fact is, we're, the point of genetics is not to say, here's your genetic destiny, get used to it. It's really to say, what's the ideal environment for your genome? And it's, all, and it's not one size fits all. And so in 1963, one of the first of these, and it's still, it's still practiced on four million uh, babies born a year in the United States is this PKU, and all you have to do is avoid dietary phenylalanine to avoid your child uh, becoming uh, intellectually disabled. So it's 100% environmental and 100% genetic. It's not 50-50, really. Uh, same thing for, for many cancer genes and pre preventative surgery. Um, and while the Genome Project has been delivering its results, uh, it's not been a failure. Uh, there are now 2,000 such genetic tests. And these cannot be dismissed as being individually rare because they are collectively incredibly common. Probably 10% is underestimate. Now that was, this is suddenly, because a million times cheaper cost, this is suddenly we're looking for rare alleles, individually rare but collectively common, and this is working really well. It's working much better than the very expensive studies that we did on common alleles. I'm very glad to hear. And, uh, and so, for example, you can do 31 genomes or, or the prote protein coding parts of genomes, and you get out 25 new answers. And that's research. But the distance between research and the clinic is zero now. Here's an example, and there are many others, where this child had intestines that were swollen and riddled with abscesses. At the age of three, already 100 separate surgeries. I think we would all agree that the diagnosis was not going well in this case. So in desperation, they sequenced the genome of this uh, child 
and immediately saw what was wrong, kind of like those pictures that we've been seeing of, of what happens when you actually dissect somebody, you see what's going on. And they changed from focusing on the intestines to the immune system, bone marrow transplant, the kid was fixed in three weeks and is still fine today. Here's an example of experiment that's just really iconic for we can now sequence individual genomes from individual cells in C2 in individual cells and find very rare cells, initially rare. Little green dots here are, both, are mutant in two ways. They're mutant in that they have a, a few cancer-causing genes uh, that have been mutated, and they have, uh, in addition, a resistance to drugs like Gleevec and, and, uh, and so on. And these green dots, uh, we did this in collaboration with George Daly's group, indicate uh, something where you really would like to detect the needle in the haystack as early as possible. And I think this is a very interesting and highly personalized. This is not only personalized, differs between you and everybody else, but it differs from one cell to another in your body. So we're not going to be sequencing your genome once, but many, many times, and this would be part of constant monitoring, like Eric Topol was talking about monitoring your heartbeat, let's monitor your, your genome and all the microbial components. So we don't go from the personal genome to traits directly. Uh, we have to think about environments. But environments is something we're getting very good at. And, and in the personal genome project, we have, uh, this is one of the main things we do. We now have branches in the United States, Canada, and Korea. There are 16,000 volunteers so far. And for those of you in the audience, thank you very much. And, uh, and for what we mean by environment, uh, they can be the medical records now through Google Health are imported directly and put onto the internet so you can see them. And if somebody wants to sequence a cohort of people that have a particular set of uh, traits, then, then they can prioritize those. And uh, in red are, is what we consider environmental components, some of which actually have genomic components. And I don't really have time to, to go into uh, all the uh, data for this, but we, we are monitoring the microbial components of each of the, of the volunteers um, from five different body sites. And the immune response to it, where we can actually, again, because of this great decrease in cost, we can now sequence the entire immune response, not just at one time point as a snapshot, but in a time series sampling um, on the order of hours to days to weeks. Uh, in green is the, is the traits, and if you trace the traits backwards, to some extent there's uh, the epigenome, which sometimes people mystify. It really, it is just how all this interaction between your genome and the environment plays out. And that is really part of your traits, how, how, how you develop from an embryo to an adult and how, you're how all your genes turn into uh, your facial characteristics and your health and so forth, that's the epigenome. Uh, and it's not that mysterious, it's just a lot of work to sort it out. And part of that is the immune response. Immune response is both an indicator of your environment as well as, um, as how you uh, vary from person to person. Period, full stop. <laughs>